Conservative comedy is having a weird moment. Right now it has a strange dynamic where it only makes sense in the context of two competing audiences. One, a left-wing audience that is supposedly offended or outraged at everything, and the conservative audience laughing at that outrage. Many conservative comedians play to this dynamic not by telling good or even legible jokes, but instead emphasizing how much they're bothering the other side. For an example of this, let's look at James Dellingpole's 2011 book, 365 Ways to Drive a Liberal Crazy. The introduction opens with as good a primer as I've seen. Liberals are easy meat for conservatives for several good reasons. 1. Liberals have no sense of humor. 2. Liberals have no facts on their side. 3. Liberals are hypocrites. 4. God, being conservative himself, hates liberalism at least as much as you do, which is why he created reasons 1, 2, and 3. And here's one of the jokes. Always refer in pitying, sympathetic tones to the liberal psychopathology. This implies that liberalism is a form of mental illness, which it is. That's a joke that got published in a book. Personally, it didn't drive me crazy. Maybe that's because I'm not a liberal, but I'm not sure it would drive a liberal crazy either. It's such a weak, milquetoast jab that I can't imagine anyone really being bothered by this. Maybe the joke where liberals are called Nazis would bother someone, but it's so wordy and clumsy it doesn't really hit. That's one of the weirdest parts about conservative humor right now. It requires an imagined premise to make sense. That imagined premise being an audience of easily offended left-wing people. And with that imagined audience in mind as the target, conservative comedians put very little effort into making jokes that are actually funny. Here's an example from Gutfeld, a late-night conservative comedy show hosted by Greg Gutfeld. My phony quiz directly mocked their hysteria, but it flew over their heads like Dana trying to field a ground ball. Because <laughs> it's on the ground and over her head. It's not the strongest gesture of faith in your joke when you take a moment to explain it to the audience. This whole opening monologue is responding to the mainstream media pointing out how unfunny one of Gutfeld's jokes is, and he farms that for several minutes of weak jokes that are hitting back against the mainstream media. Things aren't much better on YouTube with the likes of J.P. Sears basically making the same joke in every video where he acts as though he's just discovered sarcasm. I can say, hand on heart, honest to Karl Marx, mandates are indeed the path to freedom. So could we all please just quit being skeptical so we don't fall into the dangerous trap of thinking for ourselves? That small example is pretty much this guy's entire comedy shtick in a nutshell. He does a sarcastic impression of some imagined person on the left. And by the left, by the way, this can mean everything from moderate politicians and media outlets to activists on the street fighting for social change. Because in the world of conservative comedy, wanting to give blankets to the homeless and abolishing nation states are basically the same thing. It's all just the left. None of this stuff is clever or nuanced satire. It's just lazy references to imagined other, expressing anger and hatred rather than humor. And there's no worse offender of this than the Babylon Bee. In a video of what they claim are their best sketches of 2021, you have to stop voicing your opinions or that thing will kill us. I agree with Martin Luther King Jr. that we should judge someone by the content of their character and not by the color of their skin. You just got us killed! <laughs> All their humor is basically this lame cartoon, over and over again. All of this is probably just review because I'm sure a lot of you saw that some more news video about conservative comedy, but I was curious what it would be like to really engage with the single piece of conservative comedy media. And knowing what I would be in for, I decided that piece would be the Babylon Bee Guide to Wokeness. And in this case, I guess the only joke here is on me. This book is presented in the tradition of other comedy outlets needing to sell some stuff. The Daily Show had its textbook parodies, America the Book, and Earth the Book. The Colbert Report had I Am America and So Can You and America Again. And The Onion has published over 10 different books ranging from original content to reprints of previously published work. The Babylon Bee Guide to Wokeness presents itself as a humorous book looking at what wokeness really means and how it works in the real world. And while it's largely an excuse to tell some bad jokes, it does expect, at least to some degree, to be taken seriously. In an interview with the Heartland Institute, Babylon Bee managing editor and co-author of this book, Joel Berry, explained. We wanted a kind of a light, uh, uh, silly critique that is substantive. You know, it, we did our research and we wanted to... Um, to make it uh, accurate and, and insightful. 
He doesn't describe everything he's read on the subject, but he does name check one person. Have a guess at which of these two people they went to for their research. It's a much more dynamic and complicated relationship than you're talking about. And as far as sort of structures, that, the, the, again, you're, you're making a connection between structures in terms of institutional structures that I was talking about and the particular type of structures that, say, a saucer would be talking about in terms of structuralism. That's not actually what I was talking about. And that's not what most people are talking about when they talk about systems and structures. Again, that's a very tight correlation you draw. But and if we were to accept that correlation, then sure. But it, it's not only that we're not accepting it, it's actually not what we're talking about. And postmodernism, yeah, again, plays upon actually. a range of things. I'm sorry? I said you know a lot about this, actually. It was noted sword dancer James Lindsay, who the Babylon Bee cited as an expert on wokeness. Maybe they also looked up Mark Lamont Hill, but reading this book, it has the same forced misunderstandings of its subject that Lindsay has. For example, in James Lindsay's mind, the term inclusion is a communism. COVID policy is a communism, and justice is also a communism. Everything is communism. If wokeness is a buzzword that means whatever conservatives are trying to vilify, Lindsay is a great source for that. Each section of this book is dedicated to goofing on and explaining left-wing perspectives on culture war issues such as race and gender. And before we go into detail, let's take care of something incredibly obvious right away. This book does indeed make use of the one joke. For those that don't know, the one joke is a transphobic remark where someone says they identify as something abstract, mocking anyone who identifies with a particular gender that differs from one that they were assigned at birth. Here's an example from this book. Batman is extremely insensitive to people who identify as bats. That's what the jokes are going to be like. Get ready for more of that. While the Babylon Bee is certainly not below making that joke non-stop, as you can see from their second most popular video on YouTube, this book is surprisingly light on the one joke. In fact, it instead recycles a number of jokes. An early example is in the introduction of this book where we get this. I think, game? Though it doesn't really have any rules for what you're supposed to do with those folks in the road, so I'm not sure if this is supposed to be a game or some kind of flowchart for how your life's gonna go. The ironic finish here is avoiding becoming red-pilled so you can be woke. The most common non-ending space, aside from blank spaces where they didn't bother coming up with a joke, is the phrase, scream at sky. That is a reference to this image. This was from a 2017 clip of someone expressing their anguish over Donald Trump being elected president, and it has been used endlessly since then to mock people on the left who aren't particularly fond of Donald Trump being the president. And if you think my jump here is a little unfair, assuming this text refers to this particular image, the book helpfully uses this exact phrase as a label for this exact image when it makes the same joke a little later on. And of course this image appears in the book again, and again, and again. Here's something to consider. Was this joke funnier the third time or the fifth time? Or maybe it was never that funny, but it does signify a person that the right is supposed to laugh at, and pointing out an angry person on the left is more important than creating original or funny jokes, or in this case, a joke at all. This is just pointing at a person and laughing because they're upset. In addition to mocking the left, this book also smugly acts as though it owns all the facts, and it makes this joke multiple times. One of its favorite ways of doing that is by stating that 2 plus 2 equals 4, symbolizing how the left denies obvious facts like this one. This is another joke they make many times in this book. Many, many times. The book doesn't really trade in hard facts, though. Most of the basic facts in this book it does get right, but it's usually the bare minimum of understanding how the world works, and it certainly misconstrues the left so badly that it's virtually unrecognizable. For example, here's an excerpt from the chapter on American history. The Civil Rights Movement was the worst thing to happen in America since slavery. In it, a right-wing, left-wing, communist, Christian, revolutionary, liberator, and white nationalist named Martin Luther King Jr. encouraged everyone to judge people by their character instead of the color of their skin. Not very woke, MLK. He also advocated for desegregation, which caused whiteness to poison the safe spaces black Americans had worked so hard to build. Tragic. Obviously, the joke here is that this is how the modern left supposedly reads history, incoherent and backwards. Martin Luther King Jr. was a prominent figure in the civil rights movement, obviously. That is one of the few facts that this book couldn't possibly get wrong, and those are the only facts it really tries to present, never going past anything more complicated than 2 plus 2 equals 4. On occasion, it does go out on a limb, such as in the science section where it mistakes gender and sex, to back up its claim that the left is attacking biology, but that's about as far as it'll go at approaching any fact that might confuse a person over the age of 10. It also reveals the depth at which they understand any of the topics they're talking about. They might get basic facts that any child could understand right, 
and then fails completely because they have no real understanding of the facts that are being discussed or how the other side even sees them. Let's go back to the MLK passage, though. This is also making an implicit fact claim behind this joke, that the left doesn't understand the message of Martin Luther King Jr. and are instead perverting it to fit some kind of woke agenda. It's the sort of thing you would hear on Fox News, ignoring the radical politics of MLK, such as his support for union movements or opposing American imperialism. This book has a very bland, watered-down grade school version in mind when it speaks of Martin Luther King Jr., presenting him as a man who wanted people to be less judgmental and not advocate for social justice. Its jokes and humor only work if you're completely ignorant of the subjects they're talking about. The book spends a lot of time complaining about the violence at BLM protests, often casting BLM and Antifa as the villains. For it to turn around with this nonsense as though they're the ones truly venerating Martin Luther King Jr. is a bit strange. Here's what he said about violent protests back in the 1967 speech, The Other America. I think America must see that riots do not develop out of thin air. Certain conditions continue to exist in our society, which must be condemned as vigorously as we condemn riots. But in the final analysis, a riot is the language of the unheard. The Babylon Bee takes violence at Black Lives Matter demonstrations as the perfect chance to compare demonstrators in BLM to the Ku Klux Klan, and then makes a joke about Satan being a part of BLM. And they do all of this while pretending to revere the civil rights movements of the 1960s. I guess this is the part where the joke is supposed to be making the left angry. Obviously, this is an offensive thing. But when you look at these jokes, would you have been upset had I not explained the context here? And that's where they fail. This very lame graphic of Satan being in BLM is so boring that when I read it the first time, it barely elicited an eye roll. You really have to take a moment to consider the context and think about these jokes to realize the racism on display here. One of the failures of this book is that it does say some offensive stuff, but it's so lazy and uninspired that it can't even get that offended reaction without some left-wing YouTuber taking a few minutes to explain the context of why this joke is so offensive. If you need me to do the job of angering the left over your lame comedy, you're failing pretty hard at it. The guys at the Babylon Bee get their guffaws from how the mainstream media sometimes fact-checks their work. They assume this is because the left is too stupid to notice that it's satire, which isn't really the case. Part of the reason it needs to be fact-checked is because, to some degree, their own audience believes some of this stuff is true. Here are some real reviews I found of the book from its Goodreads page. I've been doing a fair amount of reading and research on wokeness recently, as I'm teaching a Bible class on the topic for my congregation. And as I say, I was particularly struck by the fact that The Bee's Guide to Wokeness, for all its humorous parody and satire, offers a pretty good summary overview of what wokeness really is and entails. It's so funny because it is so true. Defining and explaining wokeness is extremely funny because it is nonsensical. This should replace many college textbooks. It would be cheaper and much more direct. Be prepared to be hashtag more woke. Yes, it's hashtag satire, so this is a funny and, sadly too often, true book. In research done by Ohio State University, they found that not only are right-wing readers more likely to believe ideas that the Babylon Bee packages as satire, they're more likely to believe them than left-wing audiences will believe a satirical story from The Onion. The Babylon Bee has fired back at this study, claiming it to be flawed in that it didn't present the headlines of its stories verbatim, but the story used the same technique for The Onion headlines and it also misses the point being made. What this study reveals is that right-wing audiences are more prone to see truth in this type of satire. It's not unlike how certain audiences would look at sitcom characters such as Archie Bunker or Al Bundy as heroes, when they were supposed to be mocked. At least in those cases, though, the jokes were actually funny. Also, if you want to learn about Al Bundy being a hero, check out my video on Married with Children. Why not? It's the links down below. Anyway, back to this. I wish I had a clever transition for this, but I don't. Here's another stupid thing in the Babylon Bee Guide to Wokeness. It's the worst drawing I've ever seen of Elon Musk. All artists deserve to get paid, and whoever drew this deserves to be paid with a free copy of this book. That would be a fitting ironic punishment. Another way this book really hurts itself is when it more or less gives away how it writes a bunch of its jokes with its oppression identifier generator. Let's play it quickly and see what we get. We'll use the name of a stupid dead person so not to offend anyone. Rush Hudson Limbaugh. He would be a crazy-eyed, pansexual Calvinist with bare lungs. Yeah, 
post your own Babylon Bee joke name in the comments. The first person to laugh has to unsubscribe from my channel. The book then offers a few examples of this game being played out with some helpful drawings. And this is really how a lot of Babylon Bee humor works. Just string together random words like it's Mad Libs and vaguely gesture at how the left cares about too many different kinds of victimhood. This tactic combines itself with another internet content favorite, and that's lists. Lots and lots of lists. A list of oppressed religions, a list of good and bad countries, a list of things that are racist, a list of things leftists do and don't think are important, a list of language not to use, a list of black people the left hates, a list of ways to stop being white, and a list for spotting hidden racism. And those are just the lists before chapter 3. These lists are a convenient way to not actually write jokes. While a small number, such as the list for spotting hidden racism, actually make an effort, the rest are just some words that are meant to be instantly hilarious. Here's an example. Under a list of racist things, they include drinking milk. Because it's white. That's the whole joke there. It could have been anything white, really. Building a snowman, using shaving foam, blowing your nose with a tissue, drawing on a blank piece of paper, or painting a room white. I'm halfway through making another list, and all I had to do was spend one minute looking around my apartment and glancing out the window. This is a very lazy book. Another thing I noticed in this book is it doesn't seem to understand how Venn diagrams work. Here's an example I found that shows how each circle represents a quality an animal can have, an example of those animals when those circles intersect. This is just how Venn diagrams work. Here's one from the Babylon Bee Guide to Wokeness. It supposedly describes how intersectionalism works, and I gather the joke here is that it's not supposed to make sense, and that the left-wing people who believe this are too dumb to put it together. That's why the intersection of nationality and the power of flight is… werewolf. It's not really a joke, because none of those things are really connected, and overlapping nationality and the power of flight producing werewolf is just a weird non sequitur. It's Mad Libs all over again. Throw random words together, point at the bad group, and say, this is what they really believe. And if the person making this joke doesn't understand how to use these visual graphics, they can instead flip that around and say, it's also satire. You might say that this whole book is some kind of deeply clever psych-out that I'm not getting, that the seemingly lazy and thoughtless jokes are all a parody of the left, and since they're being sarcastic, any criticism directed towards them is deflected onto the group they're parodying instead. Except the lazy hypothesis extends beyond this book. Before the Babylon Bee slid firmly into right-wing culture war stuff, it was primarily a comedy website making fun of the excesses of religious communities. For example, they would run articles with headlines such as, There's a 15, maybe 20% chance I'll remember to pray for you, brother. It does still touch on religion today, though it doesn't quite get the same love and attention that the culture war stuff does. In the Babylon Bee's Guide to Wokeness, I paid special attention to its chapter on religion. The whole section feels like a bit of a reach, as the left isn't really known for its religious zeal, but it does have a go at claiming the left is trying to reframe Jesus as woke and is trying to turn churches into left-wing project centers. It also takes lazy, partisan political swipes. Here's one example in the section explaining how woke Jesus is. When Lazarus died, Jesus raised him from the dead so he could vote Democrat. Jesus performed this miracle a few times, raising hordes of people from the dead and leading them straight over to the voting booth so they could cast their vote for a Democratic candidate. Democrats are following in his footsteps and are still performing this miracle today. This is another example of what this book constantly does, mushing together basic liberal actions with radical movements. Voting for the Democrats in an election is preferable to the alternative, but it's hardly the type of radical left-wing politics this book is claiming to lampoon. The important part here is that this section reflects the book's obvious partisan leanings. It's about attacking the left on all fronts, from radical politics to electoralism. It's a flattening of perspectives to make lazy jokes. The main point here is that this book is trying to portray the left as co-opting Christianity to advance its political agenda. That was most apparent at the end of this chapter when it references The Screwtape Letters, a novel written by C.S. Lewis that's presented as a collection of letters from a senior demon named Screwtape sent to his nephew Wormwood. The Babylon Bee book highlights this specific excerpt from the novel. We do want, and want very much, to make men treat Christianity as a means, preferably, of course, as a means to their own advancement, but, failing that, as a means to anything, even to social justice. The thing to do is to get a man at first to value social justice as a thing which the enemy demands, and then work him on to the stage at which he values Christianity because it may produce social justice, for the enemy will not be used as a convenience. It's making the same point as the chapter, that the left is co-opting the church to further its political project, which is inappropriate since a church should not be used as a tool for one's politics. You might be wondering how the Democratic Party is particularly guilty of this when you're far more likely to see those in the Republican Party invoke God and Christian piety. 
I found this exact C.S. Lewis quote in another book, though, written in a similar sarcastic tone, only it took a slightly different approach. Here's an excerpt that followed the reading of this screw tape passage. Christianity should only be valued insofar as it helps us win political battles and shape the social landscape. What's the point of having the power of God in the gospel and the indwelling Holy Spirit if we don't use it to our advantage, such as winning the White House, the Supreme Court, and the Congress for our political party and advancing our own hot-button social issues? It's the best of both worlds. We get to hang out with our homeboy Jesus, but we still get the recognition and accolades of the world. So what are you waiting for? Get on over to the nearest GOP campaign office and start getting involved. While the Guide to Wokeness uses the C.S. Lewis quote to mock the left for being the one to mix politics and religion, this particular book flips the equation to call out the right for doing the same thing. And this mystery book I'm talking about happens to be How to Be a Perfect Christian, Your Comprehensive Guide to Flawless Spiritual Living, written by, would you look at that, the Babylon Bee. How to Be a Perfect Christian was written all the way back in 2019, and I guess a lot can change in two years, because reading this first book, you find excerpts like these. The Democratic Party was founded in 1883 as the dying wish of Karl Marx because he wanted to infiltrate the once God-fearing nation with his evil communist ideas. Did I mention this book was written with the same sort of sarcastic tone that the Guide to Wokeness was? How to Be a Perfect Christian also hits us with one of their signature lazy lists. Helpful terms for arguing with Democrats online libtard, snowflake, I'm not a racist, but pull yourself up by your own bootstraps, food stamp junkie, godless commie. One of these really sticks out, and that's I'm not a racist, but, and let's contrast this with a little excerpt from The Guide to Wokeness. This comes from its lists of secret signs of racism. Three, you say, I'm not a racist. This is an obvious one. If you say I'm not a racist or I don't hate people for their skin color, you are definitely a racist. Because guess what? That's exactly what a racist would say. The irony here, of course, is that the first book mocks how the right often portrays the left as a caricature, and then the second book just embraces the caricature, acting like the very people the first book was mocking. Here's another fun excerpt from How to Be a Perfect Christian. But we do have a word of warning for you, brave Christian Republican soldier. The most important thing you can remember as you bravely head off to the front lines to fight for Jesus in the culture wars is this, you are always being persecuted. The Guide to Wokeness, of course, makes a number of references to Christians being persecuted, such as this excerpt. But whatever religion you pick, make sure it's an oppressed, exotic, unique belief system that can score you woke points, and not something basic and lame like Christianity. If you must be a Christian, though, because your lame parents make you go to church as long as you live under their floor or whatever, co-opt Christianity for social justice. The only good church is a woke church. You can see the style here hasn't really evolved. It's all done with the same sort of sarcastic roleplay of the group they're trying to mock. Where the Babylon Bee stands becomes a bit tougher to figure out when you compare these two books. The jokes still aren't terribly funny, but this book does actually go pretty hard against Republicans for about a chapter, complaining about how they co-opt religion to advance their political goals. It even mocks conservative icons such as Ronald Reagan, Rush Limbaugh, and Bill O'Reilly. How to Be a Perfect Christian is about how Christianity is used by disingenuous people in order to feel smugly superior, and The Guide to Wokeness, the chapter on religion is making the same point, only now it's claiming the left is doing this, and not the right. You might assume this is the Babylon Bee claiming to not really be a partisan political operation, not choosing one side over the other. Only that isn't true. The Guide to Wokeness is absolutely advancing a partisan political project, whereas the How to Be a Perfect Christian has one chapter about partisan politics, instead mostly focusing on criticizing superficial acts of faith. The Guide to Wokeness is explicitly an anti-left book with nods of appreciation to the right. It is clearly chosen a side here. You might be wondering how this happened, and it may not be as simple as the Babylon Bee writers being a bunch of lazy, soulless grifters who recycle jokes to make easy money from a gullible audience. How to Be a Perfect Christian was written by Adam Ford and Kyle Mann. In late 2018, Ford, who had founded the website, sold it to Seth Dillon and moved on to other projects. So while Ford still has a financial stake in the outlet he created, he doesn't have any role in producing its content. So it's quite possible that Ford's voice, which may have included critiques of hypocritical Christians on the political right, is just no longer part of the Babylon Bee's output. Though that doesn't stop them from bringing up the same points he does, right down to the same C.S. Lewis quote, and lazily flipping those jokes to be about the other side of the political aisle. Or it's possible that the same set of jokes came from How to Be a Perfect Christian's other author, Kyle Mann, who still works at the Babylon Bee, and also is one of the co-authors of The Guide to Wokeness. And he'll make the same lame jokes about anyone so long as he's getting paid. Speaking to The Atlantic, Mann described the joy he gets from his humor like this. 
we did this great joke where we said AOC accidentally strangles herself with her shoelaces. And then we put in the headline, because she is so stupid. We're making fun of stupid boomer jokes about Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. We've reposted it to Twitter a few times. Every time lefty Twitter gets so upset. They're like, I can't believe they wrote this joke. It's not even funny. And every single time we say, we apologize for this joke. We just want to clarify that the joke is that she strangled herself tying her shoes because she's so stupid. And then they get mad at that. It's hilarious. We're the only ones in on the joke. His point doesn't really make sense here because saying something isn't funny isn't really the same as being upset. If anything, it's absence of a reaction, not laughing, and then informing the person telling the joke that it sucks. But I want to focus on the point about how the Babylon Bee is making some kind of meta-commentary, ironically mocking boomer jokes, a special in-joke that only they're getting. But if they are mocking boomer jokes, it's not even consistent with an earlier comment from that same interview, where this exchange happened. Who is the audience for the Babylon Bee? I'm always amazed when we get emails from overseas missionaries who are underground and can't reveal where they are, being like, hey, you guys are keeping us sane. The boomers love us. We got the boomer humor market locked down. Are you proud of that or a little ashamed? Gen Z humor sucks, so I'm cool to be called boomer humor. The Babylon Bee is an unapologetic outlet for boomer humor. Except when you point out how bad their jokes are, then they're actually mocking boomer humor. Regardless of how they defend their weak humor though, The Babylon Bee's Guide to Wokeness is a deeply lazy book, recycling jokes throughout its run, some borrowed from memes that are nearly five years old, doing the bare minimum to vaguely gesture at humor with effortless list, and in some cases reusing jokes from books they published a few years ago. Going back to the Heartland Institute, the Guide to Wokeness's co-author, Joel Berry, said the book only took a few months to write, which sounds, if anything, slightly longer than I would have guessed. Here's one particular part of the interview I enjoyed. It is kind of modeled after um, our infographics that we publish mm -hmm. on the site. So we do these kind of funny, like corporate art style stick figure infographics where mm -hmm. we're, you know, explaining how to do something uh, silly. We wanted a kind of a light, uh, uh, silly critique that is substantive. You know, it, we did our research and we wanted to um, to make it uh, accurate and, and insightful if you want to read it cover to cover. But um, it's also just something you can pick up and, and there's going to be a joke no matter what page you turn to, a funny picture. Um, and it's just silly. You know, we felt like people needed to laugh at this whole movement. And let's go back to how to be a perfect Christian one last time. The best way to engage in conversation with those of opposing worldviews is to misrepresent their positions using a hilarious meme or graphic and then plaster it all over the internet. I hope the irony isn't lost on anyone. A few of my patrons had questions about this video and I want to answer them here. A few people asked me if there was any part of this or any part of the Babylon Bee's output that I found genuinely humorous. That's a very good and challenging question to answer. I think the closest I got to laughing is in its list of handy tips for being less white. They aren't great jokes, but they reveal a level of self-awareness that shows uh, an actual familiarity about stereotypes around white people. Smash your Taylor Swift albums or buy hot sauce or donate your New Balances to Goodwill. With a little effort, these could have been good jokes. They're sort of mediocre otherwise. They are the closest I got to laughing though, so that was something. Another person asked if a real human being has ever genuinely laughed at a joke delivered by Greg Gutfeld. Probably not. Probably not. Another question asked was, is there a way for conservative humor to be good? And I think, yeah, probably. The problem is conservative audiences should be more demanding, I hope. And I think it takes a real effort to make people who disagree with you politically laugh. And that effort simply isn't there amongst conservative comedians who can just play to these very easy, basic narratives and not really work on creating meaningful or good jokes. Like the aforementioned list of things people can do to stop being white. There were some ideas there that could have been fashioned into real joke if even some kind of effort was put into it. And I do think left-wingers can fall into the same exact trap of creating cheap jokes but still getting a laugh out of them because they're targeted at the right person. If you would like to ask some questions to possibly get them answered at the end of a video, maybe you should become a patron too. At the very least, you'd get your name in the credits, early access to videos, and other fun bonuses. If you'd like to support this video in a non-monetary fashion, you can like, comment, subscribe, or ring the bell if you haven't already. Thank you all so much for watching.
A big thanks to Zoe B and Chill Goblin for lending me their vocal talents. You can check out their channels linked below.